Thank you very much for coming to this uh, fifth and final wow. session of our look at the book Welcome to the Wisdom of the World by Joan Chittister. This uh, has been uh, certainly an interesting way to spend the season of Lent, learning about how other religious traditions approach some of the basic questions of life. Um, as you have heard me now say several times, the purpose of these sessions hasn't been to like give you sort of like a historical, um, um, factual introduction to each of the world religions, but rather to learn what they have to say about some of the basic questions of life, the, the wisdom of the world, about the meaning of life and other such big questions. And tonight, of course, is the section on Islam. And the um, guest we have with us is Imam Hassan Ali, who is the Imam of the Mecca Masjid, uh, which means... Um, uh, learning center, masjid. Masjid is like um, the, the like a church in Christianity. Yeah, yes. but church in Christianity. We often use the word mosque, um, or um, but the word that they tend to use a little bit more often in the tradition is masjid, M A S J I D, and. Um, uh, Hassan and I have uh, gotten to know each other a little bit, been at a couple meetings together and had lunch together and it's been great to get to know him. He's the imam of the mosque which is down on Plainfield Road. Um, it's actually uh, back off the street behind a bank and so it's not very noticeable but it is down there on Plainfield Road just this side of 83 and they are in the process of building a new mosque um, further south on 93rd, 91st Street. The corner of 91st and, e and yes, Route 93. 83. Yes. Yeah. And they've been working on that um, for a number of years. I don't know, you, he might go into this, but a large number of their <clears throat> congregation are Syrian. And of course, because of the Syrian civil war, um, that has drastically impacted many of their lives, including their need to send money to people um, for, uh, to help them have food to eat at home rather than commit the money to a mosque. So it's been a little <laughs> bit of a slow go over the last uh, few years. Um, so it is uh, certainly something, you know, it, it is amazing how much affairs that we hear about in the world as a whole that we often think we have very little connection to really do come close to home for people in our community. Um, so I don't know a whole heck of a lot about uh, Imam Hassan Ali, except I do know that he's originally from Egypt and he has a stellar academic career. He studied at one of the great universities in um, Egypt in uh, Islamic studies and he is currently enrolled in a PhD program at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. Um, and maybe he'll tell you a little bit more about why that um, came about. And um, he's uh, married with two young two, kids? Yes. Two young kids. One boy and one girl. One boy, one girl. Very um, busy as a father and an imam and a student. And we're very glad <clears throat> to have him with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's working. Yeah. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. Uh, my name is Hassan Ali. Uh, again, I'm the Imam and Religious Director of uh, Mecca Center in Willowbrook. Um, in Mecca, we are uh, building our um, uh, new center. We are having now a temporary place. It's like an office building behind the Chase Bank. So we are hiding, especially nowadays, it's good to hide as Muslims. <laughs> but we are building uh, our future new center. It's a, a big one, a huge one, with uh, a youth center and a community center at large to uh, be able to serve the community and the society around us. And also it will be uh, in Willowbrook, 91st Street and uh, 83. Most of the community, just like uh, uh, my friend Mike 
told you, are Syrians, we have also some Palestinians, we have some Egyptians, uh, some uh, African Americans, some uh, uh, indo pak community. So we, alhamdulillah, we have, uh, thank God, we have a diverse community in our community. And one of the very special thing about our community that we have high educated community members. Most of them are physicians, uh, businessmen, and um, uh, engineers and professors and so on. Two of our uh, great members of the community are attending here with me to support me uh, tonight. I don't think they're coming to learn anything from me. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Warqa, she's here. She's very involved in the interfaith uh, dialogue and the social uh, services uh, and also in the election too. How was the election yesterday? Very busy? Very busy, yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, oh, wow. yeah, that's good. So thank you for coming. And also uh, my dear brother uh, Nizam Al-Khatib. Also he's one of the thinkers and uh, uh, also he's interesting in the interfaith and outreach uh, to the other uh, communities and uh, uh, different faiths. Uh, I graduated from Al-Azhar University. It's, it, it's, uh, it's one of the oldest um, uh, universities and uh, uh, religious uh, institutes in the world. More than 1,000 one year in Cairo, Egypt. And I studied uh, Islamic studies and uh, 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 religious in Al Azhar University. In 2007, I graduated from there. 2008, I came to the, to America to work as an imam and religious director. And I thought that uh, since I'm here, I'm working with this society and the community, and I moved to here, I migrated to here. Uh, since I studied the Christianity and other religions and faith and um, uh, ideologies from a Muslim perspective, let's be fair and let's study it again from uh, the non-Muslim perspective, from their perspective. So I decided to enroll myself in one of the uh, programs and I'm studying now at Lutheran School of Theology. I'm not Lutheran, but I'm <laughs> studying at Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, uh, my PhD in theology. And since then, since I started, I learned a lot. I start to learn about Christianity and about other religions. I, st I start to learn about even my own religion, Islam, more than before. My little humble philosophy of that is that I think most of the time we learn and we hear about each other. And I think it's, it is a time now to hear and learn from each other. And I thank you to, for, for allowing me and giving me this opportunity to hear from me as also I want to hear from you uh, uh, today and especially in this very difficult uh, times uh, and days nowadays in our uh, great country of America. Now, um, before I, I start to look at the book, um, actually I uh, start to read some of the chapters and I really cannot find, uh, you know, in, in, in the chapters that uh, the author John spoke about Islam, something that's really especially about Islam. I thought that he started to, to, to talk in, you know, about some philosophical, you know, points, and I see some of you already, you know, agree with me. And it's, it's, it's a common between Islam and any other religion. So I don't think that he uh, emphasized more about Islam. And even when he tried to brought something or bring something to talk about Islam, he brought it from a Sufi uh, tradition, which is, I mean, a very minority in our Islamic tradition. You know, it is well respected. However, it is not everything in the Islamic, Islamic tradition. And even without seeing, uh, you know, somebody to talk about Islam in, in four chapters or five chapters, without even quoting one verse from the Quran or one uh, hadith or uh, tradition saying from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saying, uh, I don't know how can we attach this to Islam. However, it has some points, some good points that I learned, some good stories that I might, uh, you know, use in my speeches and in, in my mosque and so <laughs> on. Uh, uh, but we, we will go through it. But before we start, I know that, that there is certain questions are common to all of us as human beings, you know, like such as why was I born? Why we came to this life? What's important in this life? How do I know the right thing to do? How do I know if I am following the right you know, path or, 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 or track? What does it mean to make a difference? What's wrong with me if there is something wrong with me? Why can't I change if I have to change? Uh, 
Such questions are so deeply human that they, you know, are common uh, and come, you know, uh, with different times and places, and they are common even in, in different religions. This, this is all like, you know, when you study religions, you will find that it is all about those questions, right? The purpose of life, why we are here, because if we don't know why we are here, there is no point of living this life. If I don't know why I came here today to meet you, there is no point for coming here, right? And why I'm coming here, and why I have to come here, and what will happen if I, I, I come here, this is all some questions that it's all common between all of us. Now, from an uh, Islamic perspective, we have, you know, uh, not necessarily a different approach of the answer of those questions. It might be common also uh, with the Christianity or with, with any other religions, right? Two uh, uh, Fridays ago, um, one of our main speeches and services we do on Fridays, uh, noontime or afternoon, so it's, it's around one o'clock, when you have all of the mosques are full of people, just like Sunday morning in the church, right? And uh, I, I invited about 15 of our uh, 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 friends, brothers and sisters from Lutheran School of Theology and uh, McCormick Theological Seminary with two or three professors of Christianity to come uh, to our mosque. So they came, and usually what we do this day, that we start to give a lecture. You know, and this lecture or uh, preach, we do like 30 minutes of lecture, and then after that we do a short prayer. And it's very important prayer, and that's why you see everybody in the mosque, because you have to do it in the mosque. You cannot do it in some other places. You know, the other prayers, you can do it in your, in your office, in your uh, uh, classroom, in your home. You can do it anywhere. But this particular prayer, you need to do it. If you can, of course, you need to do it in the mosque. So uh, uh, the, the, when I invited them, actually, this was like two days before our annual fundraising dinner, right? Because we are building the new center, and the cost with the center will end up with like $11.5 million. You know, because it's not just a, a small place, it's a huge place. Not as big as your church, of course, I'm <laughs> sure. But it's, it's a big place, and nowadays everything is expensive, so it will cost us a lot of money. So, um, uh, you know, I was thinking and debating, you know, to talk about something to encourage people to donate because it's just two days before the actual dinner, so everybody should prepare himself or herself, you know, to donate. But also I want to address something. So my friends from Lutheran School of Theology and McCormick Theological Seminary, they, they can learn from too. So what I found that, 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 that there is a lot of similarities between Islam and Christianity, for example. And this is not something to say because I'm the church. I, I saw that, you know, and I, 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 I said that in, in my mosque, you know, two uh, uh, weeks ago, right? That sometimes it's very similar to the point that when you quote some uh, 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 Bible verses, you know, that Jesus said something, and then you quote some of the Quran verses or Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, verses, you may feel that both of them just came from one source, it says originally one text, but two different people translated in two different ways. It is as similar as this. Okay, the concept of, of, of the upper hand is better than the lower hand. You know, the giver is always better than the, the receiver. The concept of, you know, those people when, the rich people, when they went to give a lot of money and a lot of gold and a lot of stuff, and then this, this poor lady came to put only one coin, you know, and, and then Jesus said that, that she is better than them. Why? Because she donated, you know, the only thing that she got or the a half of her wealth, while they donated maybe, you know, nothing. If somebody has like a million of dollars and he donated $5,000 is, 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 is nothing compared to his wealth. But if somebody has nothing but $200 and he donated $100, this is 50% of his, of his wealth. And the same thing we have it in the Islamic tradition when Prophet Muhammad said that dirham sabaqa al dinar in Arabic, which means that uh, maybe $1 will be even better than $1,000. And then they ask, how is that? It's, you know, it's an economy, it will, never, it will never happen. 
And then he explained that maybe because this is the only thing you have, or it's a half of what you have, so you donate it, you sacrifice it, while the other guy, he donated 1,000 because he has a lot of money. So it's the same thing. Same thing. You know, when you, when, you, when you go to talk about visiting the sick people and the ill people, and when you visit them, you will find God there. Right? When you feed the hungry, you will find God there. When you uh, uh, help the, the needy, you will find God there. This is in the Bible and also in the Islamic tradition. There are so many things to, uh, uh, to share. But most of the time, because of our ignorance, and I'm talking about my Muslim community and about myself before anybody else, we do not learn about each other. We think as Muslims that we know everything about Christians because, you know, simply we have one chapter in Quran called Mary, and we know about the miraculous birth of Jesus, and we know some of, of his miracles, so we know about everything about Christians. While on the other hand, the Christians, they think that they know anything, everything about Muslims. What they know about Muslims that they are violent people and terrorists and they just you know covering the, the, their ladies you know and they are killing each other and so on and so forth and actually we do not know the truth that's why it's very important especially now to learn and hear from each other not about each other now I will start after that with just a little short introduction about Islam what is Islam we hear, we hear the word Islam a lot. So Islam is an Arabic word originally, and it comes from a root uh, uh, of uh, silm, which is peace, right? And also come from the word uh, sallama, which is submit. So Islam means peace and submission. So as a Muslim, you claim yourself a Muslim, you, what, what does it mean? It, it means that you submit yourself to God. You submit yourself to God's orders, okay, and whatever comes from God, you are, you know, you have a full submission about that, right? So, Islam has five pillars. They are the main five pillars of Islam. The first one is to be a witness, to say some words that you first, you, you believe in it in your heart, and then you pronounce it which is what we call it shahada. And shahada in Arabic language means to witness something, right? And what you have to witness, you have to be witness that there is no God but God. And that Muhammad is a messenger of God, right? And I will tell, I will tell you later that, that if Muslims only believe in Muhammad only, or they believe also in the other uh, prophets and the messengers. But when you look at the word shahada, which means witness, so for me, I never witnessed God. I never met with God. I never had a meeting with God. What? Right? You know, I mean, physically, I never... Really? No, yeah, no, no, we don't meet with God. God never talked to us, just like Christians, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only on Tuesdays, though. Only, yeah, only on Tuesdays. Yeah. But, I mean, physically, when the word shahada means to watch something, to witness something in your eyes. When you go to the court, okay, you say that I will be, I will be witness because I saw something. Okay? I witnessed something. But, we, you know, as Muslims, we never met with God before. You know, physically, we never. Right? We never met with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before. He, he passed away 1,400 plus years ago. Right? But we believe in it to the level that is as strong as witnessing. So we really can tell that there is no God but God, as if we can see that there is no God but God. And we can tell that, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger of God, as if he is in front of our, of our eyes, and we believe in him as a messenger of God. This is what the shahada means. Right? Then the second pillar is prayer. That prayer is a common thing, that everybody pray, right? but with, in different ways. You know, as the Muslims, we believe that all of the prophets and messengers, they came from the same source. They came from one God, right? But the way of their practice is different. And now you can, you can name God with whatever name you want, but He is God. You know, it, it could be God in English, it could be Allah in Arabic, but this is God. The name is not the problem. The, the name is not the main issue. The main issue is that you believe in the creator and the sustainer of the universe. The one that he supports and guides all of us. Right? So prayer in Islam, we have five obligatory prayers. Daily prayers. What? You know, so Muslims always pray in, in their day? No, they are very short prayers. 
<laughs> right? Yani, so e each one of them maybe five to ten minutes. Right? We have one in the early morning before sunrise. We have one uh, at noon time or afternoon, just a little bit. And then we have one around nowadays around 5.30. And then we have one um, around 7. And then we have one around 8.30. Right? This is too much, right? I know. <laughs> yeah, it's five daily prayers. What we call prayer in, in, in Arabic, the Arabic uh, translation of prayer is salah. And salah means connection. Mm. Okay, salah, connection. So why it's five? Why, why we don't have just one long one, maybe 30 minutes, at the end of the day, and that's it? Okay, no. Because God wants us to connect ourselves with him all the time around the day, right? So the first thing we do in the morning is to just pray to him, is to connect ourselves to him, to seek his guidance and his uh, uh, power in the morning, in the early morning. Then, you know, when we go to the work and we are busy with doing stuff, now noon time comes, you know, we go to eat lunch and stuff. Now there is a time, it's, it's, it is the, uh, the middle of the day, it's good to connect yourself to God again to go to ask him to support you and to uh, guide you and to thank him for what he has given to you in the, at the beginning of the day. Then another one, then another one, then the, end, the last thing you do after everything is to pray to God so you go to sleep and there is a lot of connection in your day. Right? So those are five daily prayers. And we have the main one, as I said, in Friday. So at noon time or around noon, this one is very special, and we have to do it in the uh, congregation. You know, the, the rest of them, we don't have to, we can do it in any other uh, place. Their number three comes after the shahada or the testimony, and the prayer is zakah. And zakah is something also is common in many religions, which is the money that, that we give, you know, or we take from the rich people and we give to the poor ones. Right? And not everybody is, you know, qualified to give this zakah or this money. It's not like taxes. Okay, so everybody has to uh, pay taxes. I um, you know, unfortunately, I have to remind you about taxes and the season of taxes, but uh, <laughs> this is the reality. This is the money that if you have 85 grams of gold, or the value of this in dollars, for the whole entire year in your saving account, so you're saving this money, okay, now you have to pay 2.5% out of this to the poor people. So again, you know, if you have uh, uh, 85 grams of gold, okay, and Brother Nizam, he's, uh, he's, he works in the gold, uh, gold field, so he can yeah, tell us yeah. more about gold, right? If you have 80, <laughs> expensive, 85 grams of gold, okay, uh, you have it for the whole entire year. This is the minimum, of course. If you have more than that, this will apply. But less than that, you don't apply for it. Which means that if you have this amount of money, like $5,000 or $10,000 in your saving account for the whole entire year, that means that you're good. You don't need this money, right? So it's good to share 2.5% with your neighbors and poor people around you. And this is obligatory in Islam, that you have to do it, right? You know, if you are working as a farmer in the agriculture, you have to also to take out of whatever fruits you got, like 5% or 10%, depends on how you bring water or irrigate your, 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 your land. If you have camels, you know, and or sheep, there's different ways of business and stuff. So this is something that if you have, you have it, you need to share with others. And this is, we have it everywhere, right? In any religion. Then we come to Ramadan. Did you heard about Ramadan word before? Sure. Yes, so Ramadan is a month uh, based the, uh, Ramadan is the, nine, the ninth month in the lunar calendar, okay, in, 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 in Islam. So it sometimes comes in the winter time, sometimes comes in the, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, summertime, and unfortunately nowadays it is in the summertime, in June and July. Why I'm saying unfortunately? Because we have to fast in this month, right? We have to fast from sunrise to sunset. And fasting also is a common thing, but with different practice. But our fasting, we fast, so we don't eat, okay? We don't drink, we don't have any, you know, uh, sexual relationship with our wives. From sunrise to sunset. So it could be 16 hour, 14 hour, less or more. This is how it is. Now, after sunset, now it's a break. You can do whatever you want to do. Not whatever you want to do, but you know, <laughs> the okay uh, things till the next day uh, before sunrise. 
right? And this remains for the whole month, which is sometimes comes 29 days. This is the lunar calendars. Sometimes 29 days, sometimes 30 days. Okay, and this is the fasting in Ramadan. Then we have the last thing, which is Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca. And pilgrimage also is a common thing. Okay, we go to Mecca in Saudi Arabia and we uh, 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 practice some ritual actions and this is also has very uh, um, uh, special time in the year. So it's like two months after Ramadan. So we go there if we can and this is obligatory only once if you can. And if you can here means financially because it costs some money from America. Here it costs like seven, eight thousand dollars. Okay, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you have the ability, healthily, to go there and to practice those things. And by the way, the Kaaba in Mecca, this house of God, we believe in Islam that who built this house of God? Do you know? Do you know who built Al Kaaba? Do you know what's Al Kaaba? Do you? Abraham. Abraham, yes, and his son Ishmael. They built Al Kaaba after they received an order from God to build it, right? And then after we go and we walk around Al Kaaba, we drink some water from a well there. It's a, it is a, the only holy water in Islam, which is called Zamzam water. And this Zamzam water actually came because of the baby, little baby uh, Ishmael, and his mother Hajar. Right? And then we go and we walk between two mountains to follow the footsteps of Hajar, the mother of Ishmael. So actually, most of the Hajj or pilgrimage in Islam is about Abraham, Ishmael, and uh, his mother, Hajar. Right? Those are the five pillars of Islam. Can you say it again? The first one is? Huh? Yes, witness. The, the witness, the Shahada. There is no God but God, and that Muhammad is a messenger of God. Number two? Prayer, the five daily prayers. Number three, zikah. the zikah, which is the money that you you, you take it from the, you know, the rich to the poor. Then the arms. Ramadan. Ramadan, fasting. Then the Hajj, which is pilgrimage. Okay, that's good. So we have five pillars of Islam. Then what we, you know, as Muslims, what we believe in. And this is very important too. Now we have six pillars of our faith or belief, belief, or creed or aqidah in Arabic language. Okay, we believe in God. This is number one. So we believe in God. We believe in God that God is God. He is one and only one. He has no wife, no son, no daughter, you know, no partner. He is one. Okay, he is unique. He is not like us. He is the sustainer of the universe. He is the creator of all of us. He is the one that can decide for everybody. Right? Then we believe in his angels, that he created some angels just to obey his you know, uh, 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 um, orders. So we believe in uh, uh, Jibril, Jibrail, and we believe in all of the other angels that God G created. G Gabriel. Gabriel, yes. Then we believe in his messengers, all of the messengers and the prophets that God sent. We believe in all of them, all of them, without any exception, from Adam, and the last one, as we believe as Muslims, is Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. So, if a Muslim will come to me in the mosque to just say that, you know what, I don't believe in Jesus. Can we consider him a Muslim? No, we don't. We don't consider him a Muslim. If somebody came and said, you know what, I don't think Moses was a prophet from God. I don't believe in him. He's not Muslim anymore. Right? So this is part, this is one of the pillars of our faith. That we believe in all of the prophets and messengers from Adam to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon. Now if somebody came to say, you know what, I'm prophet. And, uh, you know, I have some connection with God and God revealed to me yesterday some stuff. So I'm prophet to uh, a Burridge community or Hensdale community. No, I also, I don't believe in him. I'm sorry, I said, okay, with all of my respect, it's a free country. You can say whatever you want, <laughs> but also I can believe in whatever I want. Let me give you the number of the mental health center. <laughs> yeah, that's, that might be a good, good advice. Yeah. Then we believe in the books that sometimes God... Uh, as we believe in prophets and messengers, that God uh, uh, selected the best of the humanity, okay, to send them to guide the rest of the humanity. So we believe that all of the prophets and messengers, they are humans. They are the best of the humans. They are the best of them, right? But they still humans. Then we believe that God has sent to some of them some books, some revelations. Some verses, some words, some teachings, some guidelines, 
Right? So we believe in all of those books. We believe in the Torah, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the Quran. Okay, we believe in all of that. Right? We believe that God has sent, you know, some revelation to some of those prophets and messengers just to guide the people and to remain after the prophets and messengers' lives to be guidelines for all of us. We believe in all of them. Right? Then after that, so we said we believe in God, we believe in His angels, we believe in His messengers, we believe in His books. Right? And then we believe in the day of judgment. That after death, it's not, death is not the end of the story. So, actually, death is the beginning of the story, right? Because it will be the beginning of the true life. When God told us in the Quran that the, our true life not here, it's there. But we have to prepare in order to, I mean, move to there, we have from here, from now. So, we believe in the day of judgment. Then the last thing what we believe in, was the, which is the will of God, which is, that means that everything is after the knowledge and by the will and the choice and the plan of God. Nobody do anything to surprise him. He know everything. He know the future, he know the past, he know the present, he know everything. And he decide for everything. Okay, and we follow, we are following his rules and his, um, uh, his guidelines. So this is, this is basically are the six pillars of our faith or Iman or uh, uh, creed, you know, Aqeedah. Right? So we have five pillars of Islam, and then we have six pillars of Iman or faith. Any question about this? Well, let me ask you a question just about the last one. Um, you say that you, that Islam believes in all of the, well, not the last one, but you say that Islam belongs in all the books. Yes. But clearly the Quran um, is more special yes. than the others. Yes. And in Christianity, of course, there has been debate for 2,000 years about, about, the, our, about our Bible, that the Bible is our central book, it is, it, it's incredibly important to all of our faith, and yet there are great arguments that have gone on for centuries about just what it means to say that. There's those who take the Bible literally, and those who take the Bible much more figuratively or allegorically or whatever. Um, what would you say is the range of belief in Islam about how to read the Quran? Okay, that's a very, very good question, and very important question. Um, there is differences, you know, as I'm a student of theology also, so I, I, I study, you know, uh, some courses about Quran and Bible and what is the differences between Quran and Bible and stuff like that. So. For Muslims, we believe that, that, that God revealed Bible, right? And we believe that God revealed Quran. And we believe that the Bible and the Quran both are the actual words of God. Okay? So we believe that the, the, the words of God is just the words of God. Right? Now, for Muslims, they believe, and historically this is true also. I mean, that Quran, you know, uh, 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 since 1400 plus years ago till today never changed. There's no even a little, you know, uh, change in his words. And we're talking here about the original text, or, you know, in Arabic language. Of course, we have different translations, and translation is translation. So it's not, it's not the actual book, right? So in the Quran, God has told us some of the stuff that it's already in the Bible or in the Torah. Right? And we, I can see it now because I read both, so I can see some of it now. However, also, since in Christianity, you know, there is no, uh, I mean, uh, uh, agreement about one version of the Bible to be the, the one to follow. So for Muslims, they stopped there and said, well, now we don't know. So we will read the Bible if we want to, and then whatever match with the Quran, we take it. Whatever doesn't match with the Quran, you know, we stop, we don't take it. If something that we, there's no mention about it in the Quran, but it's in the Bible, it's up to us to take it or reject it. Why? Because we don't know any knowledge about it. Something, somebody is coming from outside to tell you, you know what, I was in, in Mexico City and they did uh, this caravan and, you know, carnival and stuff like that. I don't know any information, so I, I might believe in you, I might just reject it, right? But if I know that this is not true, because I, for, for, for Muslims, they believe that God revealed Bible, okay, but they don't know for sure where is the original text of the Bible. 
And so just to be, I mean, clear here. For the Quran, it is not this, the case because Quran, the, the Quran that we read here in America is the same Quran that we read in Russia, is the same Quran we read in Canada, same Quran we read in Saudi Arabia, the same Quran that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 1400 plus years ago. You know, and I think you heard about, you may hear about uh, uh, some discoveries, you know, in England a um, few months ago about one of the oldest um, uh, copies of the Quran that's, it's, you know, um, very old, you know, and it's really match with what we have now. So historically, it's, there is no change. And the difference between, well, this is not because we are so special as Muslims, so it's, it was preserved like that. It's because that Muslims, they memorize the actual words of the Quran. Okay, so for example, if somebody just decide to burn all of the copies of the Quran or to destroy all of the software of the apps in the cell phones about the Quran, it's not a problem. Why? Because we have little kids in Neighborville, in uh, Bridgeview, in, you know, in Willowbrook, they memorize the whole entire book. They memorize it by heart. So they will, they will recite it and then somebody will, will write it from them. So uh, the Quran, the source of the Quran is not the actual book. It is actually the people. Until today, when I read the Quran to my uh, teacher, you know, I, we read it verbally, right? We have, we have a, a chain of, uh, of narrators, yes, that's connected to Prophet Muhammad. So for example, when I come to be hired at Mecca, I said, okay, so do you have this, uh, uh, you know, Sanad, which is a chain of narrators for the Quran? I said, yes, I recited the Quran to this uh, teacher and he recited to his teacher and we have the names. And his so, teacher recited to his teacher till Prophet Muhammad. So at one point, a few years ago, you could recite the entire Quran in Arabic. Yes. To a teacher who was certified to he, like, who, who recited to his teacher, you. yeah, who recited to his teacher uh, verbally, not reading from the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and his and his teacher recited to his teacher to his teacher to Prophet Muhammad. And we know all of those names. And not only that, there is a studies and and some that. some special fields of, of Islamic study to to look at the names. You know, we have here the ch uh, checking background, you know, if you're applying for credit or something. So you said, okay, let's see your social security number, what you did in your past. And so they, they have books, okay, to look at every and each individual and see, you know, uh, what he used to do in his life. Do, do you get like three mistakes? I mean, no, if you get, if you, you, know, you, it doesn't mean that you don't do mistakes. You do mistakes. Oh, you do make you do mistakes. mistakes. And he corrected to you and he makes sure that, you know, you understand, you understand because we are human. So I oh, cannot, okay. Okay. I cannot recite like 600 plus pages in Arabic language without any mistake. Okay. That's impossible. <laughs> yeah. But, but we, I we, somebody can do it. Uh, uh, some people, yes. Yeah. Some people demonize it even by lines. So they yeah. tell you, in pay, if you tell them in page 410, what it said, he will tell you. Yeah. Right. You know, some people, some, some people, they, they are, they are talented. They got this talent. Okay, but what about this issue about reading it literally versus reading it figuratively? I mean, we'll say the, I, I don't know the Quran well enough to know, but say it says, um, one Muhammad speaking the words of God says, one day I sat under a fig tree, and Allah said that. The stones of the earth were once What's round that? and now they're square. Yes. I mean, does that mean that that happened exactly or was Muhammad trying to make a point by writing that story? Okay, good. So first of all, we don't read in Quran that Muhammad said that I was doing this and this and this. Otherwise, Quran will be the words of Muhammad. But we read in the Quran that God directly is saying that I told Muhammad so and so and so, or I'm telling you, or oh readers, whatever, Muhammad or people comes after him, so and so and so. This is very important. So in the in Quran doesn't mean the, 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 narr the narration from Muhammad, you know, about his God. No, it is the actual words of God. So God used to reveal the Quran through the Gibrail. You know, so Gabriel is reciting the Quran to Muhammad, and Muhammad is reciting the Quran to us. So we, when Prophet Muhammad is reciting the Quran to us, he said, for example, we created the earth and the heavens. Of course, this is not, we here never refer to Muhammad, it's referred to God, yeah. right? So, so we don't see that in the Quran. In the Quran. So uh, whatever in the Quran, we believe in it literally. However, 
there is not all everything in the Quran is general to just follow and to take. Okay, some of the rules and regulations just you know was occasionally for such an occasion or you know certain time that it it, it, it cannot be applied now, right? And some of it it is good for every time. Okay, and who's, who can tell us or who can figure, okay, there is people that they study and they, you know, this is their, their profession to tell us that historically, you know, God revealed this because this is happening and that's happening. And, and, and that's why it's very, very sensitive to, for example, for people like ISIS or Al-Qaeda or some of them to just quote one verse from the Quran that it was especially about one special occasion at the time of Prophet Muhammad, you know, to deal with some people that they, you know, uh, humiliated him, they kicked him out, they tried to kill him many times, to kill him, and then they take it and said, okay, see, this is what God is, is ordering us to do, to kill those non-Muslims. No, this is not true, right? So we, we cannot, and of course, the same case in the Bible, you cannot just take one verse out of its, you know, meaning and, con and then apply it for everything. So the context matters. The ta of course, it's, yeah. it matters. And not only that, I mean, every day we have to reread and rethink about the, the actual verses of the Quran. So, for example, Prophet Muhammad, he never explained and made like uh, explanation of the Quran, the whole thing. Why? Because if he did, nobody can think anymore. If the Prophet is telling us that the, the, this verse means one, two, three, four, who am I to say anything after him? But he left it for us. So we can come today and discover new things. Every day we discover new thing about the Quran, from the Quran. Why? Because the Quran, supposedly, it is like prescription from God to the humanity to follow till the day of judgment. So it's not just was only for the Arab people or uh, people at the time of Prophet Muhammad. Otherwise, it will be just a holy book that you just recite some of it in the morning. Maybe when somebody die, you recite some. When somebody is sick, you recite some, and that's it. No, it is like a, a, a guidance. So you have to read the Quran as if God revealed this message to you. Let me ask you something about your, uh, another piece of your introduction about the daily prayers. Yes. So five prayers a day, and the idea is to, con is to connect you on a very regular basis to God. And it, it actually kind of gets close to some of her points in the book. Because one of the things she sort of warns against in the book is that that kind of routine can become just like something you do without any meaning. That's right. And, uh, you know, we, for example, in the church worry a lot that when we say the Lord's Prayer, it, you know, it just rattles off. People just say it. It doesn't really mean anything. Yes. And because that's kind of like the prayer that we say most often. So is there that same concern in Islam that the daily prayers become just kind of like, you know, oh, I said, and, and they're like specific words that you have to say, right? Yes, yes. It's not like you pray four or five minutes. It's that you say this prayer. Sure. And so those words can just become words that come out of your mouth. They don't mean anything. They don't connect you to God. Is there that kind of concern? What uh, yes, do you do with yeah, we had this concern. So it's true. However, um, uh, when, we, when you look and when we think about the five daily prayers in Islam, they're not, all of them, they're not similar. So we have some differences in them. For example, in the first one in the early morning, it's short, it's not, it's not uh, uh, long. It's only two, uh, two moves or two raka'at, you know, which is like, you know, uh, we, 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 we stand and then we recite. Uh, the, 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 uh, one, once we start to recite, we recite, one is very common in all of them, is the chapter one, the opening. Okay, and in chapter one, we praise God, we ask God to guide us, we ask God to, you know, uh, show mercy on us and stuff. After the, the beginning, we can recite any other chapter. How many chapters we have in the Quran? We have 114 chapters. So you don't recite the, the same chapter in every prayer. So this is give it some, I mean, different taste. Okay, so for example, in the morning, I lead the prayer. So I can't really, you know, recite the same chapter every day in the morning prayer. Every day, every day, people will, I mean, it will be, it will be like what you're saying. The, the concern will be, like, it's boring. You know, we are hearing the same thing every day. But we have 600 plus pages in the Quran. I may choose any page randomly. 
okay? And I make sure that I don't repeat myself so often. So of course, I repeat myself, but I mean, every day I, I make sure that I, I recite one different page from the other one. This is number one. Number two, not all of the prayers are out of loud. So you just uh, uh, pray and you can, you know, um, uh, make it loud prayer. No, some of them are actually secret prayer. So some of them, of them you, will, you will just, you know, stand and just recite like that. Which is just between you and God. And some of them you have to raise your voice. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So also this is given like different taste. So we have the morning prayer, loud. Noon, noon prayer and afternoon prayer, secret. And then uh, sunset prayer and the evening prayer, loud again. Also, the, uh, the, the, long, the, the length of the prayer is different, okay? So, yes, we have the same concern because sometimes this is the human nature, okay? okay? So sometimes if you're doing something physically, repeatedly, every day, many times, it becomes like a habit. So many people come to me and say, you know what? We don't really feel that we are connected to God when we pray because it looks like it's just a physical you know, movement. So, I mean, we have to work with that and we have also to... Uh, try to change some of the surahs or some of the chapters of the Quran, try to pray with congregation, it helps. It helps you to, to, to focus and to connect yourself if you, if you have a group next to you. You know, I don't know if you saw a group of Muslims praying or not. You know, so the Imam or the leader, you know, standing and facing the uh, Kaaba in Saudi Arabia, and here it's like northeast. Yeah, northeast. So whenever you are, just you face northeast, and then the, you know, behind you in lines. Okay, next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. So you feel like you are connected to people and everybody is praying and everybody is facing, you know, the same direction. It helps you to, to connect yourself more with God. More than if you're just praying by yourself in the office or in the house while your kids are playing, you know, and, and jumping around you and stuff. Yes. Okay, so a, two questions about that. And maybe you should not answer, but your people should, the first one. Okay. And that is, what percentage of your congregation actually prays five times a day? Uh, five times a day in the, in the mosque or in general? Uh, in general. In general. Not, not, I mean, most of the time, they don't have to come to the building yes, to yes, pray. Yes, yes. They can pray in the office or whatever. Yes. So how much of the congregation do you think actually prays five times a day? That's very yeah, hard. go ahead. Um, Wait, we can use a his voice is loud. Because I, I don't want the I don't want the imam to have to say, oh, everyone does. No, no, no. I will not say that. Sure if everybody is praying, it's we will not. It's like television. If we don't have a microphone, we That's can't right. hear you. That's this right. This is being recorded. We're going to show it on Sunday morning also and, and online. Okay. So thank you. Just grab the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Nizam Khatib. Um, this is a great opportunity, and I, I enjoy very much, as uh, the imam said. The interfaith, and actually I started with the interfaith, participated in interfaith in Naperville. And we even carried that further to, um, suggested to them so that the interfaith come to our homes. That was really the first thing that we, one of the things that we did, and people like that, so that they can see how each one lives. How they see the Muslims, how the Christians, and how the Buddhists, how the atheists, and so on and so forth. To answer your question, it's an excellent question. Um, we are all human beings. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so you're not an angel, as I thought before. Okay. Okay. I this think, is convinced. Uh, the Imam knows that I'm not really the most angel person. I'm, a, I'm his student, and probably I give him a lot of questions. And so <laughs> he bothers me all the time. So. I bother him all the time. But you know, I, I definitely I, he teaches me a lot. Um, the, to answer your questions, we are all human beings. I think the interpretations of Quran and Islam it differs from a person to a person. Uh, uh, Muslim persons. So some of us are strict, some of us are medium strict, some of us really, uh, you know, they, they believe uh, conceptually and they don't really follow in, as far as the prayer is concerned and as far as many other concepts. And I think I wanted to also comment on the previous point that you mentioned earlier, which is, you know, uh, do people, you know, regarding the text of the Quran, how strict <coughs> people can follow the text of the Quran. I think there is a lot of you know, uh, discussions with, with some people. Yes. There are some people who are really cannot even uh, bear the fact that somebody can discuss what's in the Quran. They take it literally. Yes. And there are some people who are open-minded to, 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 to really recognize that we are humans. 
I want to understand how my Christian brothers think, how my Jew Jewish brothers think, how my atheists. We are all humans. Uh, God created all of us, and they created us for a purpose. So how did he become this way? How did I become this way myself? And I think we reach a stage in our lives where uh, I am at that stage where I want to find out the truth. You know, I think a lot of us think that, oh, we are right. And that's the biggest mistake. Because everybody is right in one way or the other. You know, everyone is right at, at some stage of their lives. It's like, you know, you, you go in the streets and sometimes you don't see the trees, you don't notice the trees. And at a stage of your life, you start re realizing, oh, look at the beautiful flower that's in this street. I never noticed it before. Mm -hmm. um, so some people, you know, depends on what stage in their life, you know, they recognize, oh, I want to understand more. And some people believe that this is the, this is the fact. I'm going to follow it strictly. I'm going to pray five times, five. And I, I cannot really tolerate anybody who doesn't. And there are some others who really will tolerate and will accept and they will be open-minded <coughs> to, uh, to, uh, to appreciate the other religions. No. I hope thank, that answers thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank, thank you. So, okay, so, so, so actually, I, so I can add to that that, okay. uh, that not the majority, you know, I mean, just like any other religion, Islam is not an exception. The majority of the people that they claim that they're Muslims are not really following Islam. Okay, so majority of the Muslims, they don't pray the five time daily prayers. Okay, majority. Okay, uh, uh, but also, uh, you know, and this is very important for me to, to, to point here in this point, that, uh, that sometimes we, 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 we like to give a general um, judgment about, about uh, a community or a society or a religion, right? So, I mean, if I have a bad experience with uh, a Christian, I might think that Christian people are not good people. If I, if I am like, you know, a Chinese uh, dude and I had some bad experience, uh, you know, with an American, uh, I, I will think that Americans are not good people. So I, I don't really uh, see that it's, it's fair to give general judgment to people. So we have people that they claim that they're Muslims, but they're not, okay? And they kill each other, and they kill Muslims, okay? And they kill non-Muslims, you know? Can we just say that all of them, all of the Muslims, just like that, because those people uh, are there? No, we can't. Can I say that because I can, I go to Friday and I see the, the mosque is full of people praying, so all of the Muslims are, are praying? No, of course not. Can I come to the church on Sunday to see people, very nice people, and you know, uh, 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 people come to connect themselves with God and say all Christians like that? No, of course not. Yeah, so it's just like Islam is not an exception for that, for this point. Okay, uh, yeah, and so I'd like to ask you this, the second question then. <clears throat> and that is, you know, very few, uh, in general, we are woefully ignorant of Islam. But one of the things that most of us probably have seen is Muslims at prayer. And, of course, the men and women are always separate. And... Um, <clears throat> First of all, why is that, and what is the like spectrum of belief about that? Do some of the women say, yes, this is exactly as it always has been, it should be now and always will be? Or some of the women say, eh, you know, maybe we need to find something different in this area. He's smiling. Because you are, you are, you are the best one to answer he's, this question. He's smiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's working, it's working, it's working. He's smiling because I cannot claim that. First of all, I'm, my name is Warka Barmada. I'm a Syrian American. I'm a Muslim. And you see, I don't wear the hijab. And this might Hold also, the microphone right by this, this might also answer your question uh -huh. because it's part. Uh, I don't know whether what I'm going to say now agrees with what a lot of Muslims believe in. And I consider myself maybe a progressive Muslim. As far as the Imam knows, we are always on the same page. And that's why I'm here today, because I think he's doing a great job at Mecca. And by the way, Mecca is not only masjid. It was, Mecca is Muslim, it's a cultural center in addition to be being a mosque. It's standing for Muslim Educational and Cultural yes. Center of America. So, yeah, that, a, great, a great name. I think I mentioned this <laughs> at some point. Their Mecca is a acronym. 
And what yes. Muslim what? Muslim Educational Cultural Center of America. There you go. Yes. So, <laughs> as far as the women and how they pray in the mosque, in it's a common practice that men and women pray in different halls. And if this is not the case, as in their mosque now, in the mosque now, uh, there's uh, they put screens. This does not mean that this is how it should be and how our religion tells us it should be. Because if you go to uh, Mecca in the pilgrimage, the actual you one, will the see the one actual, you will see them praying next to each other. They are not divided. They don't say women on this side, men. Am I right? Yes, you're right. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I'm. I was really. They uh, about two weeks ago, they uh, conducted a tour in the uh, at the new mosque on 91st. It's not finished yet, but it was. They wanted to show us before the <laughs> so fundraising dinner. Money? Yes, yeah. before, before the Hopefully, fundraising yes. dinner. Yes. Yeah. We know and that the ladies, they have the key for the <laughs> seats. <laughs> so I was really, really happy to see that in the new design, they have what they called, after many, ba many battles, I think, a holding room. This is not the main prayer hall for the Friday prayers to which a lot of people come. This is for every day. Not many people come every day. And in this hall, men and women pray alongside each other. Maybe not in the same room, mm -hmm. to be honest, but in the same room without any screens, without anything but dividing. Like one yes. side of the room and the other side. Maybe of the room. it's up to them yeah. to decide. Yeah. Uh -huh. Let me yeah, let me just uh, add something to uh, what Dr. Warka said. So uh, what, what we do uh, in our prayer, we, we, our prayer, you know, really has some movements and physical movements. So we don't sit and pray and or stand only. No, we just we we bow down like this. Okay, and we go, you know, down to the, uh, you know, ground like this. Okay, so for such mo you know, movements in, in, in for, for, for male and female, yes. it's not comfortable for, for, for me to pray, you know, in front of me a female doing something like that. We are humans, okay? Yes, we are praying, <laughs> but we are not saints, okay? You know, uh, you, so in order, in order to, for us to focus and also for you, you know, as a female to feel comfortable. I mean, sometimes you have a, you know, tight yes, a little yes. bit, clothes and stuff. So what we do is we have the rows of the prayer in front for the men, for the male. And then behind we have it for the female. Okay. Now the question here is: Should we have divider between both or not? The, the, the thing is that some of the females they feel better, they feel comfortable more, especially if, you have, if they have some kids or something to nurse or something that they have a little divider so they can have some it's privacy, nice. right? Some of them they don't. That's why in our new construction, just like what uh, Dr. Warka explained, we have two options. We have one option when if you want to just pray in the same hole, you know, but of course behind, uh, you can do that. If you want to go to the mezzanine level, okay, when we have a very special um, uh, babysitter and nursing room for the kids, also you can do that. But this is, has nothing to do with our, I mean, we have our, uh, um, in, in our board members, we have a lot of ladies, yes. okay? We have one of our community leaders, uh, Sister Warka, she's very active and, you know, she, she come every time and help. Uh, we allow, uh, you know, ladies to, to teach us, to give us some lectures in our educational um, uh, gatherings like that and, and stuff. So we don't have any discrimination, okay? okay. Yeah, we, we welcome them. And this is all, this is what should uh, we do. Again, not all Muslims practicing that. I, I, I Thank you very much. I want to add one more thing. No, sure. Since I see that most of the audience are females, we have males too. <laughs> as a woman, as a Muslim woman, I know that for my American colleagues and for Americans at large and the Westerners at large, uh, the women's issue in Islam is a real, I call it as the Achilles heel of Muslims. It's the what? It's the Achilles heel of Muslims. Oh, okay. So, as a, a Muslim woman, I think that, as he said, the interpretation, it's, it's the actual words of Quran is very important. They are really, really important, but the interpretation is also important. Yes. So interpretation today might different from 
the interpretation when they were revealed at some occasion. So I, I once gave, just to give you an example, I don't know, you might disagree with me, I'm not that knowledgeable about uh, uh, the creed, but let's take the stoning, because they all, we are at always in the media about, uh, not in our countries, but maybe in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan. in Afghanistan, stoning uh, for adulterers. Uh, I once gave a, a presentation at my library about uh, <coughs> Islam and especially women in Islam. And I, I studied, I really studied. I couldn't find anything, there, there are lashes. They lash them if they are, and you have to have five witnesses of the intercourse itself. Four, four witnesses. And it says this Yes, literally. that's right, that's right. It says this literally. You, you have, have to hide. Yeah. Which, is, which, is, which, is, which is impossible. I'm pretty careless. Which is impossible. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the punishment in the Quran is the lashing, right? Yes. And someone came to me afterwards saying, the hell, but you did not mention the stoning. I said, Honestly speaking, I didn't find anything in the Quran itself. Yes. Maybe it's in the practices. Then I inquired about this, yeah. and they yeah. told me about the practices. Yeah. Yes. But anyhow, this is just one example about how we, as Muslims and as Muslim women, are really seen in the eyes of the West. Uh, like. I'm not going to say. And just to tell you something, now there's a movement, when I did this research, I discovered that there is a movement within Islam, a feminist movement. They are re did you know about this? They are re sure. they're looking at the Quran and what it says, and their interpretation is based on linguistics, ethnography, um, history, uh, uh, and anthropology and many other disciplines. Uh -huh. yeah. So, to be fair, I, I feel comfortable being a Muslim woman. I don't feel that I am any less than any yeah. other Muslim. So, so Islam, is, Islam by itself, I mean, in its own Thank practice, I, I will just have some uh, comments here, just a little one. That when we look at the uh, Quran as a book, it's very hard to practice you know, a text without an application. Right? So you go to the medical school and you study for three, four, uh, seven years or whatever. If you cannot just go from a, 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 a textbook and make a surgery, you cannot do that. So what you do that you go to practice, right? To see that your professor, you know, doing the actual surgery. And we in Islam, you know, as I understand Islam, we have the textbook, which is the Quran, but we have the application, which is the Prophet. So if we study the life of the Prophet, the life of the Prophet is full of honoring the woman. Okay, actually he, he honored the women to the, you know, it's unbelievable. You know, his honor, he was very romantic. He used to listen to them. He used to sit with them. He never, you know, beat any, he was in a community or a society that they used to bury their, if the, if, if, if the news came that you, you, your wife delivered, just left, delivered a, a, a girl, they used to bury them alive. And he was in such a community to come to say, no, this is, this is impossible to happen. And he raised their status and he never stood you know, out of respect to anybody but for his daughter. Every time his daughter comes, he stand up and he kiss her and he you know, sit her. And even when he died, he, 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 as a prophet, and as a, he never died in the mosque praying to God. He died when he was in the lap of his wife. Okay, hugging his wife, you know, just she was very, very, uh, you know, worried about his sickness, uh, holding him, and he died there, right? And there are so many things to mention about women in Islam, but again, that's very important. Thank you, Dr. Warka, to uh, point that uh, I, I look at the application through the life of the Prophet. If we really study the actual true life of Prophet Muhammad, we really can see a, a great uh, man that he, uh, you know, respected the ladies. Uh, this gentleman over there, he raised his hand many times. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I hope it's an easy question. So. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's what we call a softball, you know, it's real easy. Okay. So, um, you know, in the Christian religion, uh, we might have certain verses of the Bible. You know, of course, we have the Lord's Prayer that we love and you know the 23rd Psalm I know you've read that yes the Beatitudes you know is another section of the Bible blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall you know inherit the kingdom of God and so forth so 
all of those things are comforting to us as Christians. Um, and I was just wondering if within the Quran, if you had or were permitted as a clergyman to have sort of a favorite section of the Quran, and I was wondering if, you know, you might, you know, recite it and tell us what it means. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, everybody has his favorite, uh, you know, uh, part of the Bible or the Quran. The, the one that he really liked to listen to or to recite, or he likes the meanings of it. And one of my favorite ones is chapter Mary. Right? There is one whole chapter in the Quran uh, is talking about Mary, and Mary in Arabic called Maryam. Right? And I believe it's chapter 17 or so, if I'm not mistaken. Okay? And in this chapter, actually, by the way, I found m many details about Mary in Quran than Bible. And just go and Google it and, and, and look at it. Okay? We have many details about Quran. This chapter, Mary, is actually longer than chapter called Muhammad longer okay and it's very beautiful because of, of its rhyme and you know the the, uh, the actual arabic language of course the original language there is nothing i mean can match and compete the original language okay because it is the actual language of the of the book okay the translation is still translation i mean I, you know no matter how good you are in, in, in english language or in arabic language you still can translate and also by the way mentioning about muhammad and mary uh, uh, God has mentioned Jesus, the name Jesus in the Quran, about 25 times. While he mentioned the word Muhammad in the Quran only four times. Right? Yeah. Because there is some misconception about Quran that Quran is the words of Muhammad. If Quran is the words of Muhammad, if I am Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa you know, I know that I came after a great religion called Christianity, and there is thousands and millions of people are following it, and now I'm bringing a new religion, so I'm now, I mean, in competition with this religion. So I will never mention, you know, the other guy. Why I should mention him and <laughs> praise him, right? And, and mention some great things about him, right? And his miraculous birth, right? And his mother and how she suffered. You know, when she uh, has given the, uh, uh, the birth to him, right? And, and how God Almighty told us in Quran that Mary is the best woman, you know, in the whole humanity. She is the best of the whole humanity. And how her mother, okay, before even, you know, when she got pregnant, she said that I, you know, whatever in my, in, in my body will be in the service of, of you, O oh God. And now when she delivered him, she found her a girl, and she said, well, you know, I have to fulfill my promise, but girls are not like boys in this regard. And Mary was the first one to study and teach theology in the temple at that time, right? And, you know, we know, we know about the story and the story going on. So what, this is one of my favorite uh, surahs. Uh, Mary, and uh, uh, not only uh, God has mentioned Mary in this chapter, but he has mentioned her in many other chapters. So for example, I will recite some in Arabic, and I will try to translate it. I'm that, not that good translator, but I will try. <coughs> إن الله اصطفى آدم ونوحا وآل إبراهيم وآل عمران وآل إبراهيم وآل عمران على العالمين ذرية بعضها من بعض والله سميع عليم إذ قالت امرأة عمران رب إني نذرت لك ما في بطني محررا فتقبل مني إنك أنت السميع العليم فلما وضعتها قالت رب إني وضعتها أنثى والله أعلم بما وضعت وليس الذكر كالأنثى وإني سميتها مريم وإني أعيذها بك وذريتها من الشيطان الرجيم فتقبلها ربها بقبول حسن وأنبتها نباتا حسنا وكفلها زكريا 
كلما دخل عليها زكريا المحراب وجد عندها رزقا قال يا مريم أنا لك هذا قالت هو من عند الله إن الله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب This is chapter number three in the Quran when God Almighty is telling us that, that, that he selected some people and some families, you know, from all the people. So he selected Adam, and he selected Abraham, and he selected uh, uh, and the Imran, Imran's family, which is the family of Mary, you know, uh, and he made them better than everybody else. And then he said that, remember when the mother of Mary, she promised God to give whatever in her body, you know, her baby, to the service. And then when she delivered, she said, she is girl, she is not like, you know, a boy in this regard, but she will be in your service, O God, and I will name her Maryam. Then uh, God Almighty said that we took care of Maryam, we took care of Mary, okay? And we made her, you know, grow up in the best manner. And we made Zachariah to be in a charge to take care of her. Of her. And he said, God said that every time Zechariah will enter the temple, he will find Mary praying and he will find next to her some fruits. And, um, you know, the explanation here will go that he used to find some fruits, the fruits of the winter time in the summer time. And the fruits of the summer time in the winter time. And there is no fridge, of course. And there is no Sam's Club, <laughs> right? So he used to ask, from where you got this? Because at that time, they used to sit in the temple. They don't go for shopping. They don't do anything. And she used to reply, this is from God. God has given me this. Then when Zechariah saw that, he, he, Zechariah at that point, he was old and he got no kids. So he asked God to give him you know, one of the kids, so he will try to take care of him and grow him, you know, uh, to be a nice man. And God has answered his, uh, answered his uh, request, and he has, give, has given him who? John. John, which is Yahya in Arabic, John. Yeah, so this is just part of it. Yeah. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Mm, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that. Sure. Can you just wait for the... Get the mic. Uh, you mentioned about... Right, you got to hold it right next to your mouth. You mentioned about uh, Muhammad's uh, uh, love for women, or at least uh, looked upon them almost as equal. How, how uh, do Muslims justify honor killings? Is there anything in the Quran that would justify that at all? Okay, that's a good question. So how can Muslims justify honor killing? Okay, um, I mean... As I know from the practice of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as I know from the practice of his companions, you know, there is no such a thing like that. So we can't just go and decide for ourselves to just, you know, kill this or kill that. We have to have a rules, we have to have a government, we have to have a, to have a judge, we have to have a court, okay, to, this, to have to put rules and to decide for those stuff, especially killing matters. You know, in Islam, to kill one human being, you know, and, and of course this is common word in every, and this is also words in the Quran, and it's common in every religion, that if you kill one person, God will punish you as if you killed all the humanity. And if you save the life of one person, God will give you the reward as if you, you saved the whole humanity. And if you killed one person without right, it's even more greater than to destroy the Kaaba, which is uh, our, you know, house, the house of God that we all, as Muslims, 1.5 billion pray, next, you know, towards it. So killing in Islam is very, very, I mean, I mean, not only in Islam, in any other religion, but, you know, since we're talking about Islam, there is no right for anybody to decide to kill anyone, you know, just, just because he doesn't like it or because, uh, you know, she did something or, 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 or something like that. This is something related to culture most of the time. This is something related to history most of the time, but has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Again, as you uh, know, I got uh, lots of questions, but let's see what you have. So, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Okay. So, 
in, a, in the Christian faith, we have different denominations. And in Islamic faith, there are three sects, the Sunni and uh, Shia. Mm -hmm. And I forget the last one. Okay. Uh, mainly and, Sunni and Shia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sufis, maybe? I don't know. Okay. Well, I know, I know Sufi. I, okay. Um, but of these three, and of course, in our Salafi. own religion, you were, you were Salafi? talking. Salafi? Okay. No, or, Salafi is not. Okay, yes, go ahead. I think it's K-H-A-G-I-D or something, Kajid. I, I don't know how to K -H -A. What the proper enunciation is. Okay. But at any rate, um, in our own faith, we have progressive... Christians, we have fundamentalist Christians, yes. you know, and so, and, you know, when you were saying, you know, this person had a bad experience with a Christian, and maybe all Christians are bad, and, yes. and there's a lot of that going on politically right now, too. Yes. So, what, what faith is, which denomination is your mosque, or is it a combination of all three? How does that work? Okay, first, I don't know about the third one, um, maybe if you... Uh, if you know it later, you can just... Uh, but I know that the main ones are the, the Sunnis and the Shia. And uh, uh, even the Sunnis themselves, they're not one, I mean, part that you can tell, okay, that this is Sunni. Also, they have different thoughts, different school of, of, of applying the rules and the law. However, they agreed at least on the, fun, on the basics and the uh, basis of the, of the faith. Right? So they agreed on the basis of the faith. However, I can disagree with uh, Dr. Warka, for example, but we're still you know, following the Sunnis. So most of, uh, of my congregation are, are Sunnis. We welcome everybody. Here, including uh, Christians and Jewish and anybody. Okay, as I said, I invited uh, some friends, but we most of, of of ours are Sunnis. And actually, the concept of Sunni and Shi'i, of course, as you know, the Sunnis are the majority. Okay, so Shi'as are, are minority among the Muslims, and uh, uh, the center of uh, uh, Shi'a world is in Iran, as you know, so right? Uh, Shia are the minority. Yes, Shia uh, are the minority. Was it eighty-five percent of the world is Sunni? Um, I, I maybe I don't know exactly, but uh, right. yes, majority of Muslims are Sunnis, right? And actually, this concept of Sunni and Shia, it it has some differences, but again, not all the Shia even one group. So you will find some Shia that they are very far from the Sunnah, and they have a very big disagreement with them. Well, you will see some of the Shia sects, I mean, they are very similar. They just like disagree with one or two points of the principles, right? So they are not all the same, just like, you know, in, in, in Christianity. Yes. Uh, as I see it, actually, actually it's not, um, it's more of a political it yes. started yes. as a political rather than a religious division. And it started in the early days of Islam and it, with the succession, the problem was who succeeded Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, after he died. Yes. The Shiites believed that his son-in-law and his cousin, right? Yeah, it should be in his family. Should the, the leadership should be in his him. family, yes. It started there. Yeah. And then this question continued until his son, uh, uh, Ali's, Ali the cousin, came. This is why you see them. I don't know whether you have seen this. They, they regret that the Iraqis, and that's why in Iran and Iraq, you see most of the Shiite centers. Because at one point, historically speaking, it is said that they told him, they told Ali's, who's the cousin who was, who's believed, who the Shiites believed should have succeeded Muhammad, the, they told him, come and we will back you up. And when he came to Iraq, he and his family and tribe, and they were all killed. So they let him down. To this day, maybe I'm um, digressing, but it's interesting if you see. <laughs> in, to this day in Iraq and on Shiite places and in Iran, the, the, they beat themselves in memory of letting him down on the day of the death of the grandson. Now, 
But I personally, and you might agree with me as well, it's more a political. Yes. Then it's, with time, it, it there start to we be religious. Had, uh, yes. Religious, but the basics are the same. That's yeah. right. The basics between Shiites and Sunnis are the same. I, yeah, I don't. Speaking. I don't understand anything about the theological differences, but you can say the exact same thing about the difference between Protestants and Catholics. I mean, really, in the in the beginning of the 1500s. It was basically a political division yes. between the princes of Germany and the Pope, based in Rome, and the Holy and the Holy Roman Empire. And um, you know, it, of course, yeah. it developed as a religious distinction, yes. but you know, it's the same sort of thing. There's a whole it's lot a of political like, issues. That yeah, it, 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 it. it started like that, just like uh, Dr. Warka mentioned, that after the death of Prophet Muhammad, who should uh, you know uh, be the governor or succeed him? So, so the Sunnis, so the Sunnis was the majority of the community. At, at that time, there is not no word of Shia. Shia means a group. So they, they, they think that, okay, I mean, he never, if he wants somebody to follow him, he will tell us. You know that this should follow me, but you know it was hap it happened that when he was you know sick a little bit before he died, uh, he uh, he used to lead the prayer. So he allowed uh, his friend, his best friend Abu Bakr, to lead the prayer, and people understood from that that this it's it's an it's like uh, nomination. Okay, it's it's not like you have to, but it's like nomination. And he was very wise, and he was very good to follow him. So they elected him. Then after that, Abu Bakr, he I mean he suggested one of the uh, companions, not not his son, but one of the, his companions, and he elected them. Then Omar, which is the third uh, uh, one, he said, okay, I think there are six people that I know that they're good for that. It's up to you, but you can choose from this. So it's every time there is different. So in Islam, we do not have one solid. Um, uh, way of, uh, of of choosing the governors. Okay, it should, it should be in um, uh, election or it should be in uh, sel you know selection or something like that. However, the Shia, on the other hand, they think no, it should be actually uh, in the family of the Prophet. Okay, it should be within the family of the Prophet and their followers and their sons and their sons and so on and so on. So that's why they call Shia, which is the group. They are they are attaching themselves to the uh, um, the house of the Prophet. So let me make that. We, we got to finish fairly soon, but I want to ask you two more things. What, first of all, make that personal for me. So, like, we hear a lot in the world today about the, like, the, the fights between Sunni and Shia. And, you know, especially in the Middle East, a lot of the, you know, the battles that don't have to do with Western influence, we, you know, Sunnis and Shias would be killing each other anyway. So, it's... Uh, Obviously, that is all problems that have to do more with what's going on in the Middle East than it is something like inherently about Islam. Yes. But let me ask it this way. If your daughter grew up to marry a Shia, is that okay? For me? Yeah. No, it's not okay. I mean, for, for okay, because I mean, it depends. As I said, which which kind of Shia she will marry to? Because I said so, some of them they are very far to the point that they insult the wives of the Prophet, for example. Okay, they don't. They, they, I mean, if you're insulting the wife of my Prophet, I mean, what kind of of Muslim you are? Okay, I said if you insult, like you know, Mary, you're not a Muslim. Right? If you insult the wife of the prophet, so you know about the prophet more than he, he does. So some of them, they're very extreme. Some of them, they're very close and very similar. I mean, perhaps with that, that, that might be okay. Okay? So as I said, Shia, they are not only one group. And just like you said, for hundreds of years, Shia and Sunnah, they lived together in the Muslim world. You know, uh, this has started 1,400 years ago. For hundreds of years, they lived together in Iraq, okay, in, in Iran, in, in, in Syria, in Egypt, in Yemen, and everywhere. Uh, but only when there is uh, some hidden agendas for the politicians. Actually, the politicians use that. Just like sometimes, I mean, in Egypt, we have a lot of Christians. We have like 7, 8, 10 uh, million uh, uh, Christians uh, with the Muslims. And for, for hundreds of years, they live together. We live together uh, in peace. Now, only when the leaders want to do something, they start this fire in between us. But this is when never, I mean, if there is fight between Muslims and Christians in Egypt, you will never find any Christian living in Egypt till now. The Christians in Egypt are high educated people. They are very rich. Okay, they have a very good positions, and I mean, we, they are our friends and our neighbors and everything. But I think it's all about politics. And you, you, you will, you will look at Iran. 
okay, and this is the, the center of the uh, Shia. You know, on the other hand, the uh, other you know countries like maybe Saudi Arabia or some other countries trying to make some balance between. And now Syria is the um, uh, playground, so people do, uh, give money to, do, to 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 their allies, and those. G I mean, it's it's a it's yeah. a whole you know political game that it's not really has nothing to do with the so religion. So it would depend on the person, of course. Then and of course it depends yeah. on the person. Yes, of yeah. course, because I mean we we have we we have no problem. I mean, why Muslims Sunnis they don't kill you know in their countries the Christians, for example. And they are supposedly they are even different than more than the Shia for them, right? At least the Shia they have some. I mean, they believe in God, they believe in uh, Muhammad, and you know they read the same Quran. But the Christians, for example, they don't read the Quran, so they should go and, and, and fight them. But they don't. Why? Because it's not about religion. Most of the people are not religious, in a, you know, anyway. So they don't care about religion. But it's all every time whenever you have a hidden agenda to just, you know, for example, for example, in, in, in Syria, you know, the Shia want to rule the country, and you know now the Sunnis want to rule the country. And in Iraq, I mean, again, you know, Saddam Hussein, and he was, he used to humiliate the Shia, and you know, and now the Shia want to take over, and it's just a political game. So. It's the same, I'm Syrian, it's the same as the, as the Imam mentioned, it's the same in Syria. It's a political power game. Yeah. Yeah. Iran wants to dominate the whole area, Saudi Arabia, the Sunni it's just that. So let me, I, I, I think it's important to, um, to, to, the, I'm sorry to close with this. We should have gotten to it a little earlier. But I think it's good to ask, talk about the sort of like elephant in the room of, um, of the world today. And I've had a long conversation with Hassan about ISIS and what in the world that's all about. And, you know, I, I can't expect him to, you know, ask it in like, you know, answer the question in like three minutes. So I'll just you know, say that after a long conversation with him, um, I know that he thinks ISIS is just as ridiculous as all of us think it is. I mean, the killings, the brutality, the, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, attempt at world domination, et cetera, et cetera, is all just... Um, it's, it's a violation of Islam, it's a violation of humanity, Nin it's horrible, awful. 95 of their victims are Muslims, by the way. 95%. 95 or even more yeah. of the, of the yeah. ISIS victims are Muslims. And me personally, I'm suffering from them because they are making my job very difficult. Right, exactly. So that's what I was going to say. So, so I don't expect you to launch into a big, big criticism of no, ISIS. No, no, no. We no. take that for granted. Yeah. But do talk about sort of like how that whole situation affects you and your people. Yes, so th that's a very important question. I mean, and I know everybody is, is, is worried now about ISIS. One time I was preparing for my speech, and I was looking for, it was very great speech uh, from the first uh, 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 caliph or, uh, you know, uh, leader after Prophet Muhammad Dez, Abu Bakr. So I said the uh, khutbah of Abu Bakr, or the speech of Abu Bakr. And Google told me the speech of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Yeah. Okay, and, you know, I start to listen to uh, or to see what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi said. and the, the, the uh, the leader of ISIS. The leader, the leader what, what, what he called himself, the caliph, the caliph, you know, the khalifa or, or whatever. I mean, for just a, a small group of people, I don't know from where they came, I don't know who is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or what is his background, okay, to just come and to claim himself the leader of 1.5 billion Muslim in the world, I don't know, I mean, I don't know any word that I can, you know, uh, politely say in a church, you know, about, about that, okay? <laughs> this is number one. Number two, uh, they have like, a, um, a magazine that they issue like every uh, month or so. And I'm not really a big, I mean, fan of them, but I was uh, reading uh, one of the articles I remember, I don't know if it was in Washington Post or something, a Muslim uh, writer, he, he quote some of it, and the magazine called Dabiq, the Daesh or the ISIS magazine. And they said, we want the Muslims in the West, you know, to come with their resources and their money to us. 
okay? Because they cannot stay there, you know, uh, uh, afraid of, or, of and putting their guns, you know, uh, you know, uh, under their pillows, just waiting for anybody to come to fight them. This is what Daesh or ISIS want. They want all of those physicians and professors and doctors, you know, and businessmen working in America and in the West to go there with their resources so, so they can support them. That's why they are bothering us here. That's why they will, they, they will send one crazy man, you know, contacting him in, in the internet or, or, or Twitter or whatever, just asking him to bump himself or to kill some random people, right? Why? Because they, they don't want us to be here. Now, by raising this voice and say that we don't want Muslims in America, we are exactly doing what ISIS, you know, uh, said, what, what they want. This is what, what ISIS want, exactly. Because imagine those people, where they go? I mean, we are, you know, I mean, we are building 11.5 million mosques here. We are building it here. We are not building it in Iraq. We are not building it in, why? Because this is our country too. Okay, the future of us is here. You know, our kids were, you know, were born here. Most of us were born here and we want them to continue to stay here. We are not building only a place so we can worship God between us and him. We are building a community center. When we can invite our you know, fellow you know, brothers and sisters to our mosque, to our center, to talk. You know, just like you, are, you have a great facility here, you invited us so we can talk. We can make soup kitchens, we, can, you know, we have a lot of physicians so we can have free clinics. We can serve this community. We have you know, hundreds of physicians. They're serving this great country the day and the night. Nobody will know about them. Nobody will tell you in the memes. Why? Because they're not ISIS. But everybody, unfortunately, will know about ISIS, which is living thousands of, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, you know, of, of uh, miles, away. miles away. I mean, this is, this is something that, you know, as I said, makes our job here very difficult. Okay? And we are, we, we are repeatedly you know, want to say, I mean, the, the, those people are not Muslim. Those people, they don't, ex they don't uh, uh, follow the Islam that I follow. They don't understand the Islam that I understood. And we don't have to say that. As also, I do not expect you to uh, say that some groups, like any group, I mean, right. with all of my, like KKK or any group, I mean, they really are the true Christian and we should all like follow their, their footsteps. Everybody is you know, has his own understanding of things. I, w I know that you have some question. Okay, last one. I did, and it, it kind of ties in with what Mike was saying. If your daughter was going to marry a Shia, um, how would you feel about that? I mean, this is a... a and, 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 and what I wanted to say, because this is almost Shakespearean, you know, the uh, Romeo and Juliet, um, but you look at, uh, for instance, Ireland. Um, there was warring in Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants. And I thought, well, wait a minute, you're all Irish. What's the problem? Yeah. And, and, and I, and I kind of go refer to what your brother, is he really your brother? Or is it just like brother? No. Like Honorific. Yeah, figured, yeah, yes. Okay. Like, Whatever. We're all brothers and sisters, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. But when, when he was speaking, he said we are all human. And so what I would say to you is, where is that in your answer to Mike? That well, we're I mean, all human? Uh, the, the, okay, this is, I mean, if we are all human, I doesn't, wanted to say that's this. good, that's good. But if you are human, it doesn't mean, for example, that everybody will accept, uh, I mean, um, uh, if he's a Christian, will accept a Muslim to marry his daughter, for example. It could be, it could be not. I'm just, just listen. Or a black person to, to marry a white one, or a white one to marry a black one. Okay? This is something, I mean, you know, personally, that you, you have your concerns. We, we can talk about that, okay? I don't want to uh, talk negatively about anybody, but I mean, this is something that. Uh, yes, you treat him as a human, you respect him, you try to help him to the, I mean, you don't harm him. But for, 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 for some points, I mean, something that you don't feel comfortable doing, right? But at the end of the day, if she decides, and this is her decision, and we are in a free country, what can I do, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, you cannot really, do anything. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. When push comes to shove, yeah. <laughs> we don't really have control over our children anyway. Yeah. Just uh, one quick point on that. I think compatibility is, is a key. Yeah. So from a parent point of view, I mean, my daughter uh, you know, was born and raised here too. And like the imam said, if she would choose someone else, I will advise, I will give my opinion, but ultimately that's her choice. Yeah, but sure. I think she's mature enough to recognize 
you know, compatibility is a, a, a very important aspect of life, no matter where, who you are. And compatibility means, you know, if you have similar background, similar culture, makes life easier for her that's and right. for us. That's you know? right, that's right. So that, you know, that, I, that's a fact. Sorry to trivialize it, but, you know, I don't really want my daughter to marry a Cardinals fan either. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, come on. Thank you for uh, yeah. supporting yeah. my, yeah, my position. Right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Hassan, thank you very much. Thank you very we much. We greatly thank you. appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed my talk to you. And uh, I hope that uh, I will come here again and also to invite you very soon to our grand opening and uh, to come to us to enjoy this uh, great facility to help us to uh, make sure that, that we can serve the great community and the great society here in the best manner. Um, there are several uh, mosques in the area that are having open mosque days yes. um, about, about this time. And we time. also, we, we, have one we also one have, have one come and I will, I will text you or email you okay. the, the information. Okay. And we will be in touch because also you we don't have, have a date yet. Uh, not yet. Okay. But also okay. we have we have in Ramadan we have a great uh, like um, uh, dinner uh, that we invite our friends to break uh, you know the fast with us. So we fast. You don't have to fast. So you just come and you break the bread with us. You know at the sunset and we will tell you also uh, about that time. I That's think a nice event. I went to the event last year. Um, hundreds of people. Um, very good way to get to know the um, the Muslim people of the area, and so when the Ram the breaking of the Ramadan fast uh, comes around, we'll spread information. I think we spread information about that last time too. So yes. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Hassan. Everyone, we handed out a, an evaluation. So this is the end of our five-week series here. We truly appreciate your support, your attendance, and uh, the Adult Ed Committee is uh, just uh, so pleased that you're able to come and participate. Uh, we're having more programs, so look forward to other presentations through the spring and over the summer. And in the fall, we're going to have another major program on uh, mental health. Uh, uh, and so please be prepared for that. But thank you all so very much. Fill out the evaluation forms.